Good afternoon, eggheads. Juan Carlos Bagnell here for New Egg Studios, and it's the reason for the season. Wrapping up the year 2020, we wanted to host a conversation on PC building, upgrading, and modding that system to make it the perfect fit for you. There are a number of exciting new announcements and technologies to talk about, and we can think of no better guest to work through all of these tech topics than JJ from Asus. JJ, welcome back to the channel, buddy. Thanks for having me. It's awesome to be here. A really exciting day, and it's actually good to be able to talk again, right? Uh, we haven't actually talked in quite some time, and it's a pretty cool actually opportunity to be able to, you know, be speaking, albeit virtually, um, especially on a really cool day today uh, with uh, Asus PC DIY Day. Yeah, I, I was really excited when they said, hey, host this stream, because I realized, like, you brought it up when we were putting this together. It's been almost a year since you and I have been able to have a conversation. So I'm glad we're getting a chance to catch up. For sure. Yeah, it's always a great thing to be able to, uh, you know, join with you guys, especially on Newegg. We have such a great uh, base of, you know, uh, veteran PC DOI enthusiasts as well as first time builders. And I think that with everything that's gone through this year um, and, you know, for those that have, um, you know, been able to keep track of all the different launches that have been going on. Um, you know, we thought it would be a good time to be able to try to talk about, you know, um, a little bit about the overall PC DIY experience, not necessarily focus on one specific item, um, but, you know, overall kind of just take a look at it and hopefully give you guys a better insight and understanding of where we are. Now, uh, folks in our channel should be well familiar with your work by now. We've had you on a number of times in the past, but JJ, if you wouldn't mind, uh, what are you up to these days at ASUS? What are, what are you working on? Yeah, so my, I've gone through a lot of different, um, you know, roles within the company. You know, I've been with ASUS now for more than a decade. Um, and right now, you, I work under our uh, marketing team as part of our social media team. So I do a lot of things within the community, engage with uh, users on, on places, let's say, like our social media channels and our uh, PC DIY Facebook group and Reddit, um, you know, and many other places. But ultimately, I think my primary job is really to be an advocate for, I think, the community of users uh, across all the different product categories that we have in kind of PC DIY. Uh, work with our product design team, our product management team, give them an understanding and insight to the perspective of our users, and then ultimately bring that all full circle, either to you know provide insight and information on our products, our designs, our feature set, um, as well as hopefully help to evolve our you know features, functions, and designs um, so that we can keep coming out with, I think, uh, the best set of components that are out there for users to be able to have a great experience when it comes to PC DIY. And I mean, this year, probably more so in years past, I'm sure you're getting a lot of that kind of feedback is we've been putting our tech to the test this year. Yeah, unquestionably. I mean, uh, just you know, there's been a huge amount um, in terms of just the, the number of product launches, you know, you know, Intel and AMD, NVIDIA and AMD on uh, GPUs, on CPUs, on chipsets, um, you know, on SSDs. Um, even I think in the kind of supplementary components that go into builds, things like different types of cooling solutions, different types of fans, different types of RGB based devices, um, 2020, in a lot of ways, while it has been extremely challenging with, of course, uh, the reality of what, you know, everybody's having to live with in terms of the pandemic. Um, is present at the same time, hasn't stopped, I think, the progress of what we're seeing within a lot of the technologies and the components that are out there. So definitely been a lot to account for uh, when it comes to all the different facets of what you have to consider when it comes to components and hardware for PC building. Yeah, definitely the feedback we've been getting from our community too. Now, uh, for today, we've got a handful of topics to take a look at, uh, looking at some of the main areas PC builders are going to be interested in. And in this stream, we wanted it to kind of complement the work you guys are doing for the Asus PC DIY Day, where I mean, you guys have a whole bunch of fun interviews and giveaways happening today. So we wanted to join that live stream fun. Uh, we'll be looking through the comments and some lucky eggheads in the USA and Canada will walk away with Newegg gift cards. So there should be a link in the chat or in the descriptions below this video detailing all the rules of that giveaway. So good luck to everyone out there as you're watching live. Um, and, you know, may the odds be ever in your favor. That's a terrible reference. I'm sorry I even said <laughs> it. Uh, before we jump into the festivities, if you're looking to start a new build, you're in the market to upgrade, you should definitely check out Newegg's PC Builder page where you can also see a few builds that JJ put together himself for our show. Those links can be found in the description below this video. All right, JJ, we, we, we titled this something very ambitious. 
everything we need to know about PC building in 2020, which that's a lot of ground to cover. And we're, we want to look at building a system from scratch. Uh, where should someone get started? And when you start that conversation, do you look at form factor? Do you look at usage platform? Do you try and stay budget conscious? How, how should you frame the beginnings of building a system? You know, that's uh, probably the, the age old question when it comes to about PC building is what's the right way to start. Um, and I think for probably the majority of people, um, they probably go approach it first with budget and there's definitely nothing wrong with that. Right. So they say, I've got eight hundred dollars. I have a thousand dollars. I've got fifteen hundred dollars. I have five thousand dollars, whatever your budget might be. And then they attempt to kind of go and get together uh, the hardware to fit with that budget. And I think overall that still works. But um, what I would actually recommend is first and foremost, kind of really looking at, you know, what do you want to have as far as your end goal, right? Um, so, uh, you know, account for the aesthetics. What do you want the system to kind of look like? If you don't really necessarily care about the aesthetics of the system, you just want a, a box that's going to be quiet, compact, um, and offer good performance. That could, of course, considerably bring down the budget. So you don't necessarily have to start with a budget first and foremost. I think it's more almost important to figure out what do you want the overall build to look like, and then also what is its targeted usage. Um, and what I mean by usage is going to be your quote unquote workflow. This might be, you know, doing Lightroom and DaVinci Resolve or Adobe Premiere, you know, and uh, Lightroom. Um, or it could, on the other end, it could be gaming, right? It could be that you're playing, you know, Call of Duty Warzone, you're jumping to Apex Legends, you're playing Witcher 3, right? Um, or you're getting a system ready for Cyberpunk, right? Um, <laughs> or it could be maybe a hybrid situation where you're maybe doing some gaming, you're doing some streaming, or maybe you're also doing some content creation. That will generally affect the components that you have to select and also influence different aspects as far as the form factor. Um, form factor, though, is a really important one. Um, you know, we produce, of course, um, more motherboards than anybody else. We're the largest motherboard manufacturer in the world, mm -hmm. and we've got boards, whether you're talking about ATX to micro ATX to mini ITX. But picking the board will help to kind of uh, put you in one direction as far as the aesthetics, um, as far as the level of connectivity that you kind of have uh, for that type of system. So um, I think, you know, budget is a good starting point, but definitely keep in mind usage. Uh, and then from there, you know, how much the aesthetics are going to be driving, um, you know, the the overall kind of look and feel for your system. So I, I, first of all, just to kind of circle back to that, your, your initial point there, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned both sort of budget and usage. That's one of the conversations I have the most uh, difficulty with, where I, I run into a family member who has like, an idea of how much they want to spend, but then is kind of fuzzy on what the particulars of that will be. Or I, I talk to someone like, well, what's going to be the system for gaming and streaming? And then really trying to pin them down on a budget that that makes sense for their needs is, is a lot more difficult. It's always been for me the combo. Like I, I need this piece of information for how much money. And then I need this piece of information for what you want to do with it. And then from there, it's like we can have we, we can kind of finish out that chat. Yeah, and I'd probably say also the last thing too is that, you know, uh, give yourself flexibility, you know, different people um, approach building in kind of different ways. Sometimes some people are going to be committed and ready to buy everything all in one fell swoop. And then other times other people might actually buy kind of one component at a time based on, let's say, yeah. a specific aesthetic requirement or a specific component that they want in terms of the feature set. And it might take them a longer period. Um, so there's nothing wrong with that, right? And so I think ultimately, Again, this kind of starts with what's kind of the end goal, right, that you want to have if you just want to have something that's turnkey, simple and, and ready to go. Um, or do you want kind of something that you really are going to have a really unique kind of aesthetic, more flexibility, more functionality in that system. Um, and that will also proportionally probably take more time as you kind of approach PC building. And if you're just looking for kind of good baselines, this is where kind of recommendations um, that we have with things like the, um, you know, the the build, uh, excuse me, the, the build functionality you guys, we talked about, right, that we've mm -hmm. linked in the description where if you're just looking for a framework, you can look at these type of options, right? You can check out our content sites like jump.asus.com where we actually have guides and different things along those lines. So that if you want to kind of have an initial starting point and then work or modify from there, that's also something you can go about. Now, you, you started us off. I mean, you were already leading me down that path because my favorite conversations of ours have been when we've gotten to get into the nitty gritty on different types of motherboards. For, for 2020, I was hoping you could share some of the insight from Asus's perspective on what the features were, how the different lines of motherboards differed, and what were some of the trends that you guys saw when you were trying to meet the different needs of uh, your various customers? Yeah, um, so, you know, motherboards, it's, it's a really kind of, 
I hate to say complicated kind of a product category, but it can be, I think, for many people that are trying to look at, um, you know, motherboards and trying to figure out what's the right choice. And so I think from just a high level perspective, if we wanted to kind of break it down, as you guys are checking out some of the kind of the, the B-roll clips that we've got here in the stream, you can see a good lineup representation from Asus. So Asus right now has multiple series, and each series has really been designed and kind of developed to tailor a certain type of user. So... I would say our kind of our traditional stalwart series is going to be our prime series. These are a white series of motherboards. Um, they're very popular models, like let's say the Pro or the Dash A. Um, these are really kind of like a jack of all trades model that do a really great job to give you a stable and reliable system built with ASUS quality, have a good set of features, uh, a lot of connectivity, um, and offer, like I said, a little bit more of a distinctive stylized aesthetic because they have white accents as part of their design. Really well suited, I think, for general users, content creators, prosumers, professionals, and even gamers that, again, want maybe have something white. Um, when you kind of go beyond that, if you're looking for something, I think, in the higher end sphere, it's not a segment that we uh, always talk about as much, but we do actually have a line that's really focused at kind of that next level professional, which is in our Pro Art or our Workstation series, our WS series. And so these boards generally have um, more advanced connectivity, more specialized storage options. Um, they have more robust, um, I'd say, network configurations where they have like dual LAN so that you can have, you know, output to, let's say, like a NAS or let's say, you know, you have a dedicated connection for, let's say, your local area environment and for systems that might be on that local area environment, as well as a connection to the internet, um, along with kind of all the staples that you would expect from ASUS, you know, stability and reliability, uh, good tuning options, right? A really good interoperability and compatibility for things like complex adding cards, like HDMI capture cards, specialized RAID cards, um, you know, specialized controllers, um, different things along those lines. And then, of course, what many, many people and probably a lot of the users uh, that are, of course, checking out this stream are, they might fall into the gaming camp. And when you talk about gaming, we've got three different series now. So on the highest end level, we'd have something like what we have right here. This is our formal high-end ROG series. Um, no strict designation. And you can generally kind of tell one of these boards, um, not only by kind of its aesthetic design, but kind of the naming convention. Um, so uh, high-end like AMD might carry like a naming convention called the Crosshair series, or on the Intel side, it would be the Maximus series. Um, positioned right below the ROG series, but still part of the ROG family is the ROG Strix. Um, these are really well suited, I think, for kind of everyday enthusiasts. They want a really stylized aesthetic, a lot of RGB connectivity, really good specifications, good overclocking support, um, strong kind of layout options on the board. And then at the entry side, we would have something, let's say, like our Tough Gaming line. Uh, Tough Gaming is a fairly new series from us. And this is really, we're kind of, we're targeting at kind of first time builders, people that uh, maybe are just approaching PC building for the first time, looking at for a little bit more aggressive price point, but still want a stable and reliable system. They still want kind of specifications that are complementary to a gamer. So you're gonna have improvements to the audio, to the networking. And we'll talk a little bit more about kind of some of those points, but um, that's kind of like the current lineup as it is, is that we have these five different series. Um, there are of course other aspects such as like chipset diversity, and we can kind of speak to that a little bit, but that is the main thing when you're kind of looking at it, is trying to figure out where you are in relation to the series of boards that we offer. Well, and, and again, just as the audio nerd on the Newegg team, I've always appreciated Asus's commitment to high quality audio and putting in good DACs and amps on that kind of hardware because it makes such a huge difference across a number of different industries. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, you know, for us, I think on any of the gaming boards, sometimes people wonder, well, what is really, quote unquote, a gaming board, right? How does it differentiate itself? And two of the kind of the key aspects that you're going to find especially for 2020 series motherboards are going to be specifically for the audio and for networking specifications. So for many of the motherboards, you're going to find that they come integrated with um, not only your traditional like one gigabit uh, NIC, but they might have 2.5 gigabit um, controllers. They might uh, generally many of our boards are going to come with Wi-Fi 6 built on board. And we're also going to have packet priority software so that if you want to be able to manage and prioritize your different types of games. So if you're jumping into, you know, Warzone or you're jumping into Fortnite, you can quickly make sure that that's getting the priority in terms of the networking stack of all the different applications you're running. Uh, for something like audio, pretty much all of our boards are featuring, you know, an innovation that we really led the industry on, which is our isolated audio design. And so there's essentially an isolated section on the board where we have uh, the actual audio codec, we have the operational amplifier, we have, you know, our audio capacitors, and those all help to give you just better tonality, better clarity, a better overall sound stage. And many of the boards will include specialized software suites that you can go in and kind of really tailor a lot of options. And 
for some of our latest sports too, um, which can be useful, especially if you're taking advantage of things like team chat, they come with our AI noise canceling technology. So uh, you don't have to worry about necessarily having, you know, ambient noise be picked up when you're, you know, you're gaming or maybe just chatting, uh, chatting with somebody online. Right. Yeah, definitely. And, and and also to circle back to that other point, I, I think you'd be proud of me, JJ. I, I, we're making the 2.5 gig upgrade to our home network. And that's been pretty huge running media off of a NAS and then keeping my daughter and my wife working because we're doing working and schooling from home projects and stuff. It's it's been it, it's a it's been a bigger upgrade than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, well, I think the, the really great benefit that you have with networking standards is that they continue to evolve, right? That it's not happening just on the wireless side, but it's also happening on the hardline side. So regardless of, you know, kind of the, the need, right, as far as uh, whether it's going to be for, you know, a professional or it's going to be for, you know, just general um, performance uh, benefits, um, you know, you can pretty much get a specification now on these boards to really be able to help to make sure that your your network is not going to be a limiting point. And compared to many of the other kind of upgrades that you might have seen over the last couple of years uh, with things like storage, where storage has become increasing, increasingly faster. For yeah. some users, I think they might have seen networking as kind of being a specification that wasn't necessarily seeing that same type of evolution. I think Wi-Fi definitely were seeing some improvements over the last couple of years. Um, but I think that especially in 2020 with the uptick to having boards that have 2.5G, our highest end boards having 5G or even 10G connectivity. And now, of course, with the Wi-Fi 6, um, you really can just have unprecedented networking level that if you ever kind of had concerns of, you know, that your network was going to be your limiting factor, <laughs> that's definitely not an issue, um, you know, with with the modern generation of boards. Yeah, it, it, like I said, it's been a much more exciting uh, upgrade than than I think. It, we, we just don't put that same kind of like, it, it's not as sexy, but no, it's actually pretty helpful once you get everything up and running on the same standard. So you, using the, the motherboard is sort of our backbone for for building out this system and, and deciding on the different parts and pieces that we want to um, that we want to put together. What, what are some I, I want to shift gears just a little bit to some of the other components that, that Asus is known for. What are some things to keep in mind when you're trying to pick out something like a graphics card? Um, th there seems to be not not a debate, but just different philosophies on how that component, uh, other components in the box might influence GPU selection or or some people who say, like, you should build from the GPU first and then kind of tailor fit some of the other things like maybe CPU selection needs to take a back seat to that GPU selection. What, what are your thoughts on putting together that 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 kind of combination? Uh, it, again, really kind of depends on, you know, your your workflow or the games, right? So, and also even the resolution. So an example is us being a really, I think, the most complete kind of manufacturer in the component space. We kind of see things from, I think, every single perspective. So an example is, you know, we were the first to market with 144 hertz, then, you know, 240 hertz, and now 360 hertz monitors. Those are all at 1080p resolutions, and they really require very fast uh, single-threaded based processors. So while definitely the GPU is going to be critical at rendering those frame rates, you also equally need a fast processor. Um, but that's driven by the requirement of the resolution and the game um, and kind of the target refresh rate that you have within your monitor. And so this is where it's really a balancing act of trying to look at what the specification experience is that you have. If you're somebody that's targeting kind of 1440p and maybe it's not necessarily going to be as much of a factor of having to have um, the fastest CPU, then maybe you want to focus more on the GPU, right? Um, but I think when you kind of are evaluating graphics cards, there are definitely a lot of different options. And we, of course, are a Nasdaq partner. We produce both NVIDIA solutions and AMD solutions. Um, just like our, you know, uh, motherboard lineup, we have a very expansive lineup. So you can see right here, I've just stacked some cards, right? Um, you, know, you know, our, our and, highest and BD, end. Just, just grabbing some cards. Just, just, <laughs> just grabbing a couple here. Pretty, pretty good um, flex there from JJ. <laughs> <laughs> Not too much. Um, nothing crazy here, right? You know, this right here is, I think this is a, a 2060 or it might be a 1660 Super. Uh, 1660 Super, and this one is a 5700 XT. Um, so these are kind of in the mid-range. One's a really strong kind of 1080p card, and the other one is a pretty strong 1440p card, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the, the great thing is that very similar kind of our motherboard philosophy, all of them are going to be built using something that we call our uh, Asus Auto Extreme production process, which is actually robotic 
assembly precision. Um, it's SMT production where essentially all the components are placed on um, robotically. We then do actually a surface a laser analysis to verify essentially the, the accuracy and the quality of the end product. Um, and then our kind of goal, especially with the higher performing solutions, so our higher performing tough cards, all our ROG Strix cards, is to be cooler, quieter, and faster. So regardless of the GPU that you're buying, whether it's you know a, a 3060, a 3080, a new 6800 XT, um, whatever it might be, our goal there is to be able to give you a very high level of performance, very quiet level of operation in terms of the acoustics. Um, and it really just comes down to, again, what's kind of your end goal? If you're looking just for kind of a turnkey experience, you might be better suited to something like our dual series. Our dual series generally are going to have two cards in there, good thermal design. They're going to be a bit more compact. They're going to be a lower price point because they're not going to have maybe things like, you know, a significantly larger heat sink assembly, which might be more catered to users that want the lowest temperatures and more overclocking headroom. Um, there won't be RGB lighting, but the card still looks nice, right? Um, if maybe you want to step things up, the Tough Gaming series, we offer kind of a hybrid um, kind of offering where they can have very, very high performing thermal solutions, or they might kind of be similar to the dual series. It depends on the GPU design. Again, here, kind of the goal is to be very complementary to things like our Tough Gaming boards where the aesthetic kind of complements really well. Mm -hmm. um, and then with the ROG Strix cards, very similar to kind of the motherboards, is there our kind of goal is to really offer, I think, a premium design aesthetic. So you're going to have things like RGB lighting. You'll have premium features like uh, specialized fan connectors that are on the graphics card. Um, and uh, even more, more specialized kind of functions or features like we introduced uh, for the 30 series, a really cool feature on the card that actually did PCI power monitoring. So that when you connected your PCI power cables to the card, the actual card will detect the actual rail voltage. And if it drops out of actually the specification, the card will let you know by flashing LEDs. This is the first time ever kind of offered in the industry where sometimes users would have like an issue where something would happen where maybe um, the, the game might crash or their card wasn't running correctly and they didn't know, is it my power supply? Is it my graphics card? And now we actually have some built-in circuitry that we've implemented to be able to offer this. And this would be something that we would offer on our premium cards as opposed to, let's say, some of our more entry cards like the Turbo Series or uh, um, you know other card offerings that we offer. So very much the kind of the motherboards, you, know, you just want to kind of take a look at what works for you in terms of the budget, the aesthetics, uh, the feature set, and kind of the specifications. Yeah, it's one of those things that I don't know that we've ever really had that that chance to chat. We usually kind of focus on an individual component or an individual part, but also just that sort of uh, <laughs> just that kind of collect uh, that overall synergy where there's an idea from Asus where these parts are meant to complement each other. I, I, I was going to follow up with a question about cooling, and you kind of already answered that question kind of going through the GPU conversation there. So um, moving right along, we did have a couple questions come in from social media that um, just to kind of wrap up this section, uh, talking about putting together a system from scratch. Uh, just you have so much experience, and I've seen you just build systems in, in Newegg Studios, um, like from boxes of components. What would you say, uh, what, what's a mistake that you've seen or that maybe you've made uh, putting together your own system? Um, you know, I uh, think because I've been building so long, I don't necessarily make too many mistakes now. <laughs> but I would say that a pain point that still happens for me and I think actually can affect definitely a number of different builders is um, my hands. So I've got bigger hands and um, I also tend to be kind of a little bit of a logical thinker. I get kind of sweaty hands. And so... Sometimes, you know, when you're picking up different items, you're picking up kind of the memory, um, you know, the processor, different things like that. If you got sweaty your hands, you might sometimes have something potentially slip or drop, right? And so I generally find that kind of before I go into a build, sometimes I might keep like a hand towel there just to be able to kind of dry off my hands. Or I might wash my hands right beforehand with really cold water just to kind of bring down a little bit of my temperature um, mm -hmm. so that it's not so much of an issue. Um, another one to kind of also just keep in mind is making sure that you have something like the, the right screwdrivers. I have some right yeah. here. Yeah. Um, and this can be kind of a mistake is not having kind of the right tools, oddly enough, can kind of affect your overall build experience. So an interesting one here is that sometimes people ask, like, why do you have such a long uh, shank on your screwdriver. Um, and the reason being is that a traditional length screwdriver, when you're installing, let's say like the motherboard inside the chassis, you might actually find that a traditional length, you might have an obstruction. So your hand essentially kind of might be bumping up towards the side of the chassis, or if I have the cooler mounted in the graphics card, it's kind of like essentially there's not enough clearance for your hand to kind of go in there all at one time. 
And it also can affect the visibility because when you're trying to go in there, you might not be able to see the tip of the screw that you're trying to get to, and that makes it a little bit more difficult. Having a much longer screwdriver uh, with the correct head um, allows you to have improved visibility. You reduce any type of obstruction, right? And it works really well, especially for like when you're mounting with something like a radiator up here um, or kind of just different components. So I think having their kind of right tools on hand can really help uh, to streamline the, the overall build experience. And as a general tip, if anybody's wondering, good recommendation is uh, having a PH2. That's going to be the tip. Uh, for the screwdriver and a ph0 ph0 is going to be for like your small screws for like a m.2 ssd and your ph2 uh, is going to probably be your most common screw that you're going to use for just about everything like motherboard screws um you know chassis fan screws radiator screws anything like that yeah i i uh, i i thought better of it but i i was considering having like a gerber <laughs> pocket knife as like a prop to hold up yeah a screwdriver for your pc build but feel like that joke's probably played out pretty well um just just to close out this section and and again a, a part of this is just a bit more focused on someone who might be taking their first steps in in, in the pc building journey but um you know on top of those which were some great points what would what would also be maybe say your your top two make sure you consider this when you're putting the system together um I would probably say one would be actually double checking, making sure all your cables are actually flush. Um, so when you take actually a look at the motherboard, um, you know, you're gonna have multiple connectors. So everything from a fan connector to let's say your, your 24 pin motherboard power to your CPU power. Sometimes users might make the assumption that they actually have plugged in that power, but it's not fully flush. Yeah. So they really wanna make sure to go in there and make sure that they are fully flush and they're seated correctly. Um, the other thing is that occasionally, sometimes those power cables, they might be a little bit loose, they could be frayed, they could be fatigued. And so I would recommend actually even before connecting them that you physically look at them and make sure that there's not an issue with those cables because it can be a lot more problematic after the fact um, to kind of take a look at the, you know, your system, see that there might be some type of issue, something might not be powering up correctly, and it becomes a lot harder for you to kind of pull out the cables and double check all of that. Um, and I would probably say one other recommendation would be something like the IO Shield. IO Shield gets yeah. still many users. I see still builds, especially first time builders where they forget about it. Um, this kind of goes back a little bit to our earlier conversation about differences in motherboards, where you know when you upgrade to a higher end motherboard as opposed to a more entry motherboard, a lot of times just people will talk about something like the BRMs being critical. And it's not just that. There are a lot of subtle improvements in terms of a more premium board where it might have more DIY centric features. And one of them might be something like um, an integrated IO shield. So if we take a look here, like at our ROG Strix board, we can see right here, this actually has the IO shield built onto it. And I think probably in some of the B-roll shots, you guys might've seen that as well. Mm -hmm. But if we take that right next to a Tough Gaming board, you'll see that the Tough Gaming board doesn't have the IO shield built on, and this one does, right? And this just kind of also helps to paint a little bit of also the other picture where both of these are B550, but the fact that this B550 board is a little bit higher end, even if mm -hmm. we were taking a look at the ATX version, well, this one's a smaller micro ATX, um, there's more ports that are generally on the higher end board as well. So this just kind of speaks to some of those additional differences where, you know, you don't always just want to purely look at the core spec. You really kind of want to start to plan out what are the, the, the kind of the specifications and the features that you think are useful to you? How many ports do you want to be able to have? Um, you know, how many devices do you want to connect? And that'll help to kind of push you in one direction more so than another. Yeah, I mean, again, from building systems for a while now, y you wouldn't think so, but the IO shield, having having that finished piece on the motherboard is such a handy perk. I really like that. Yeah, it makes, it makes a big difference. It just simplifies things. And the other really cool thing about it too is it actually even helps to reduce EMI and ESD. Uh, some users aren't yeah. aware what those are. Essentially, you can have electromagnetic interference or electrostatic discharge. And so that can be nice to just have that integrated in there. It makes the overall build that much more streamlined. And for us, you know, at ASUS, one of the things, you know, we are talking about ASUS PC DIY and how I think we help to imp uh, improve the overall DIY experience. Um, a lot of the things that we've talked about have been ASUS innovations. We were the first company to design and develop these things and bring them to market. And I think this is uh, one of the reasons why we've maintained our position, you know, as far as being kind of number one manufacturer worldwide for so many years is because we not only want to put out good quality product, but we also really want to innovate and we all want to help to improve the experience that you have when you go about building your system, uh, whether that's going to be with specialized designs like we talked about on the graphics card, on the motherboard, or 
you know, and any of the other number kind of components that we also uh, are now coming to market with. Yeah. All right. So uh, we do want to move on to the next section. Uh, but before we do, I just want to, for everyone that's watching in this live stream, I'm going to call your attention again. We've got links in the video description and we've been sharing links in the live chats where you can see some of the PC builds that JJ has put together for us here on Newegg. And then there's been more information and some chatter about that gift card giveaway. So stay tuned for that because we'll, uh, we'll be getting to that at the end of the stream. All right. So there are folks out there that are happy with their current platform. Uh, not not building a system from scratch, but they're they're cool with their current system. But they might be looking to upgrade some parts. Uh, JJ, what are some of the items someone should look at um, when when trying to upgrade a PC? Um, you know the the, the common ones that are always going to kind of come about when you talk about traditional upgrades might be something like, of course, you know RAM. So mm -hmm. you know upgrading the RAM on your system. So maybe you've got you know. 16 gigabytes and you want to go to 32 gigabytes or maybe you've got pc 3200 right and you want to go to 3600 or you want to go to 3800 megahertz that's one another one would probably be something like um you know an m.2 going over to an ssd if you're running a mechanical drive and while those are definitely great upgrades and i definitely think that in many scenarios definitely i think an, an m.2 ssd is probably um the best overall real world upgrade that you can apply to your system from a day in and day out usage the gpu also gets a lot of discussion but I think two kind of upgrades that aren't necessarily always talked about and that are part of the DIY experience. One is going to probably be the CPU cooler. Um, you know, we recently uh, started uh, releasing our own line of CPU coolers. So we have, you know, like a lineup of Tough Gaming L uh, liquid uh, closed loop coolers, um, ROG, where we have actually multiple lines. We have the Ryu, the Ryu Gen, and the Strix LC series. Um, those are all different options from, you know, 120 a millimeter all the way up to 360 millimeter. But going to a newer cooler um, isn't just about lowering temperatures. Sometimes a lot of people focus too much on temperatures, but it can actually really help you to quiet your system down. Yeah. So maybe if you're somebody that is running a desktop and you've got it like right next to you and you find, hey, it's a little bit louder than I'd like when maybe I'm gaming, right? Or, um, you know, maybe I go into jumping in and I'm exporting, um, you know, 50 raw photos and I'm exporting out batch converting over to some JPEGs and I notice my system kind of gets you know much louder and it ramps up this is where upgrading to a better performing cooler not only will it lower your temperatures maybe even give you a little bit of a performance boost depending on different settings you might have but can provide a quieter experience and aesthetically also it can look pretty cool you know like uh two of the uh, two of the CPU coolers that we have have actually built-in OLED screens and you can customize them to put your own animations or you can put system information like your clock speed or your temperatures um so uh, there's a lot of different kind of elements that you can go about when you talk about upgrading now there, i mean obviously a lot of positives and people we get really excited you know i'm going to put just like a, a little bit more horsepower into the system i'm going to spruce things up a little bit what would you say are some of the challenges that you've seen some of your customers um uh, run into when they start jumping into this upgrade conversation yeah, so there definitely it can be a lot of kind of tricky things when you go about upgrading. Um, power, probably the power supply is one kind of critical one. So um, I think, again, reaching in my bag of holding over here. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's the Mary here. Poppins so got, desk of amazing computer components. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a, a, one of our RG Strix Series power supplies that we launched. This is 750 watt, and this is pretty good. A 750 watt, I think, along with 850 watt are kind of like those you know, golden recommended standards where it really gives you a lot of flexibility to have a lot of components, have overclocking headroom um, support. But I think that's the main thing is that when people are accounting for kind of an upgrade, they might not always be accounting for additional power, right? So if you buy, let's say, um, uh, you know, maybe something like a 3070, right? And uh, there is a difference between our 3070 dual and then our 3070 Strix card. One card might consume quite a bit more power because it might come with a factory overclock. That might be something you have to account for. Or maybe, you know, you decided to upgrade your, you know, your cooling solution and maybe you're adding something, you know, like a fan to your system. Well, you know, every few fans that you add, they have a few watts in terms of the power consumption, right? Um, so you always want to account for the power requirement and the power envelope. Do you have essentially enough to be able to manage everything that you're running in with your system? And the other kind of factor to play along with that is that if you do any type of performance tuning, so if you're overclocking your, you know, your RAM, you know, you're overclocking your CPU, overclocking your GPU, you could be adding literally maybe 100, 150 watt, uh, watts to the power envelope of your system. So a system that might have been fine at 400 watts, 450 watts, now might be, you know, 550 watts or 600 watts, right? So 
I'd say that's um, one pain point. Uh, one other, uh, you know, thing to keep in mind too, specifically, I think for memory, we see some people kind of um, make a mistake when they're purchasing memory kits and they buy like mixed kit configurations. So they have already two DIMMs, they've had that installed, and then they decide to buy another two DIMMs. And what they don't realize is if actually, Maybe I can go ahead and cut over here to my secondary cam. Yeah, while, while you do that, that's so funny that you bring that up. That was one of the questions we got on social media, and it was going to be one of the points I talked about personally in trying to upgrade my last Franken build. I did exactly that. I, I mismatched RAM, and it uh, gave me more headaches then um yeah i, I should have so, known better is what i'm saying oh but it and, and it can work and it can work but you know, can see right here that there's a label essentially on these dims right that um indicate essentially the frequency the timings and the voltage for the mm -hmm. memory and when you essentially have that ideally what you're looking for is that um essentially those frequencies and timings are designed for the original kit that you purchased them yeah. for so if you started with two dims and there's essentially a specified frequency timing and voltage and then you add another set of two dims those timings and that voltage might not be applicable to those original two dims uh, they, they're inherently going to be changed that's the reason why memory manufacturer does sell like a uh, you know a four dim kit versus right. a two dim kit now there are of course ways that you can go into the uefi what some people refer to as the BIOS to kind of tweak and tune this. And ASUS does have a lot of options to attempt to simplify this and streamline this through our one-touch XMP or our one-touch DOCP options for enabling memory. But that is, I, I think, uh, just something you want to keep in mind. Um, the one last point that I'll make in memory is that many people, when they are buying memory, they do forget that uh, many of the memory frequencies that are out there are overclocked frequencies. And so an example of this is this is an X570 motherboard. If I was to put, let's say, like a Ryzen 3600 in here, the official rated frequency for Ryzen is 3200 megahertz. Right. Uh, this stick of memory is 4000 megahertz. Now, this stick 100% works at 4000 megahertz. My motherboard could be rated at 4000 megahertz, but the CPU um, has what's up. It's called a memory controller. It's a part of the actual CPU that has to be able to operate at essentially that memory speed. And you're asking it to run a much faster speed than what it was rated for, 3,200. Um, maybe some of the CPUs may be able to do it, but not all of them will be able to. And this is something that we sometimes see is sometimes users buy kind of the, the motherboard, the memory and everything, and they think that it's gonna all work, but there are, aren't accounting for that essentially what they're attempting to do is run a very aggressive overclock frequency. And if you're kind of unsure of this, or you've never kind of thought about it, um, you might want to kind of dial back the frequency selection and go something that might be a little bit more nominal, a little bit more um, general. So something like 3600 megahertz, which uh, while it's an overclock frequency, it's, it's can be comfortably run on pretty much almost every CPU. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, again, that was also another one of my problems, mismatching memory when I was doing one of those upgrades. Um, it, it's always interesting to me because you you and I have had conversations about components. Like that's 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 how we started chatting, especially on these new egg live streams. Um, and I it, I sometimes lose sight of the fact that ASUS is a big company. Um, every tech enthusiast I meet seems to have like a slightly different relationship with your brand, you know, so, so some folks might know Asus only as like a laptop manufacturer, for example, but for when folks are shopping individual components, um, and, and just kind of speaking to what you've been doing here, you've just been pulling these parts, like, you know, off the sides of your desk and, and everything, this, this update upgrade conversation seems like Asus has solutions in nearly any component that someone might be shopping for a solution or for one of their own, uh, build projects. Yeah, um, you know, this is still, I think in some of these areas, they're still new. So like for stalwart divisions, um, you know, take for instance, like our motherboards and graphics cards, these are perennial and we've been leadership really globally in these spaces for a really, really long time. Um, but I think in kind of newer segments, things like the CPU coolers, the chassis, even with upcoming items, like we're going to have, uh, you know, our own fans that we're going to be coming out with. This is the Strix XF120 fan or things like our power supplies. These are kind of newer product offerings. And I think our goal and our philosophy really with offering these type of options is one is to offer, I think, a unified experience uh, to make it easier for PC DIY builders. One, they want to kind of be able to pair an RG chassis, RG cooler, RG motherboard, RG graphics card, know that it's going to all work well. 
it's all going to look great. And then even with things like RGB lighting, right, um, that they can use one application like our Armory Crate software to be able to go ahead and control and synchronize all those items mm -hmm. uh, through one application. And so I think that's our key benefit is really is that um, not only uh, are we a leader in that respective space, but we have, of course, the resources to really be able to offer, I think, a great experience across so many different devices. Yeah, we're, and we're going to talk about that um, in a little bit too, just to kind of follow up on some of those ideas. Uh, the the other kind of questions that we were getting in from social media, you know, this is a pretty common one, and you've already answered like, uh, your in your opinion, what's the single most effective upgrade a user can make? Um, just to kind of drill down on that, uh, just a little bit further, are you still finding that the solid state drive upgrade is still one that that um, PC builders and consumers in general? Are, are starting to to um, to to do more often or more frequently. You know, I, I remember even just a, a a couple of years back, it was still this like this hot, fresh, exciting new technology that sped up your PC significantly. And I still find it interesting when we're we're having conversations with people, and and it, it seems like this is still something that a lot of folks haven't jumped on yet. Yeah, um, well, I think, you know, the great thing is that NAND pricing has gotten so aggressive, um, you know, that I think the vast majority of builders, even in budget builds, you can guys, you can check out, of course, the builds that I linked in. I think the, the most basic build that I had um, blocked out, I think was like around seven, $780, right? That's the, that had a, a, a PCIe NVMe 250 gigabyte uh, SSD. Wow. Um, so even in kind of that entry build, there was an SSD that was present. I think now the conversation comes along is that what is a good SSD to kind of pick? Is it worth right. me making the investment to go to, um, you know, a PCI Gen 4 SSD versus mm -hmm. a PCI Gen 3, even if um, you know, my, my CPU supports that and my motherboard supports that. Is, is that a necessary investment? And I think that's ultimately going to come down to, again, your use case. Going with any type of just PCIe uh, NVMe based SSD is going to be faster than what you're going to have with a mechanical hard drive. It's going to be more durable and more reliable. Um, but there is still even benefit with a mechanical hard drive, right? The price and density for just having a, a large spacious drive that you can you know back up to occasionally um, can still be really advantageous but i think now the question really comes down to is that um, if you're going to be buying an ssd what's kind of the ssd that makes the most sense for you and i think right now probably for most people the sweet spot is probably like a 512 gigabyte gen 3 NVMe based SSD, you can get at a very reasonable price point. That's a good amount of storage space to be able to work with. I think that for the most demanding enthusiasts, for sure, if you're making the investment on, let's say, like an X570 motherboard or B550, you're taking advantage of the latest generation Ryzen CPUs, um, then yes, you can make that jump into Gen 4, but you don't necessarily need it, right? You don't have to. You don't have to be stressed as a builder that goes like, oh, I'm getting B550 and I see that it supports Gen 4 that I needed to support Gen 4. And this is also part of that upgrade conversation. Right. Um, many users, sometimes they're looking at all the different options that are out there online. They're looking at reviews and reviewers many times will always be reviewing everything from the best specification perspective. So they have the best, the fastest processor, the fastest motherboard, the fastest graphics card, all these different devices. But, you know, many uh, builders, they might have a system they built three years ago Right. Um, and if they were just to upgrade that one component, you can't necessarily always extrapolate the results yeah. from those reviews and apply them to your system. So the uplift that you might have um, isn't going to necessarily be the same, but you can still definitely have a sizable uplift. Yeah, I, I was working on a little small form factor build and swapped out um, a, a 2.5 inch SSD with a little NVMe drive. And then also just shocking how how prices have come down so aggressively on those. It, it was it was a handy little upgrade. For sure. For sure. Okay, and and uh, and also uh, JJ, you're kind of doing my job for me here. Thanks for shouting out the uh, the build kits again. Just uh, for folks that want to see some of the work that the New Egg Ninjas have put together on the New Egg specified build kits, or, or also the component lists that JJ supplied for us, you can check that out in the links in the description below this video. All right, now shifting gears, we don't want to overlook the folks. Um, yeah, so the people who aren't building from scratch, and the folks who are currently set on their current system, like all the guts. Of, of that computer are right where they need it to be. But this might be the right time to spruce up a build and play with some more modifications. And uh, I think this has been one of the more interesting evolutions in PC building over the last several years is uh, going from just trying to sham, cr cram some awkward lit fans into a case 
to this whole new generation of products and applications to tailor fill a build to someone's very specific tastes. Like the aesthetic of that system has, has never been more customizable. So for sure. JJ, I, I, I got to put you on, on a, you know, I, I got to put you on the spot here for your personal computer, like the computer that you live with at your home. Are you team rainbow RGB or are you team dark? <laughs> the world well, wants to know. Yeah, I've got two actually primary daily driver systems, and one is actually not an RGB enabled system. There's no um, RGB lighting in it. But my other system, my primary system, is a, actually a water cooled system, and it is RGB. But I don't do um, like I'd say like a more dynamic rainbow pattern. I do use mm. just a, a gradient uh, color stack. Um, I have different kind of profiles that I sometimes toggle forth. Right now, I have kind of a white and blue gradient. Um, that I really, really like in terms of kind of that look and feel of that system. Uh, but I think that's the cool thing about RGB lighting is that you have just the flexibility. Um, some people really like a bold, dynamic, kind of uh, always kind of moving type of pattern um, that kind of moves from component to component. Um, and you can set it up that way. Or if you kind of want one fixed color or if you want kind of breathing, um, you know, you have a lot of choice and you have a lot, a lot of flexibility. Um, when we first put RGB on motherboards, you know, we were the first manufacturer to ever do it. And then we've scaled out to now uh, have just an extense, expansive ecosystem of, uh, you know, what we call our Aura RGB enabled products um, that it's really just about giving, you know, enthusiasts more choice, more, more flexibility in terms of how they define the look and feel for their system, right? There's no wrong, wrong or right way to approach it. It really is just <laughs> what speaks to you and what makes sense. It's in the same way that, you know, you can get custom cable sleeves. Um, and extensions if you want to be able to add you know a more tailored look and it, it's also the same that you have within something like a motherboard right um i personally think that the aesthetic that we have on something like this rg strix board it's really really great it looks really nice it's a clean monochrome stylized aesthetic but you know this rg board that we have which has this shroud on it and it has this mm -hmm. two-toned accent just looks really clean and really polished right so um you know, that's just comes down to aesthetic preference, right? Some, some users are going to prefer one look versus another. Yeah. I, I keep my system pretty simple. I, I definitely have a lot of RGB just to have a blue breathing pattern. So it's just sort of a dark to light blue and back again. Are, are you, mm -hmm. are you digging into like all the different uh, options for back plates and cables and sort of the custom shrouds on GPUs and stuff? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, for, you know, my, I think it depends. I do a lot of different builds, I think, for the community. And so I try to have kind of different aesthetics that I tailor towards, um, you know, and I think the great thing is that there's a lot of choice and a lot of flexibility, even in the way that we've designed our product portfolio. Again, this kind of gets back to what we talked about in the motherboards that maybe you're a professional prosumer. Maybe you don't necessarily want all this bold lighting. Um, so you might go with something like a WS or like a prime board. Um, you go with a nice clean, you know, fractal, you know, designs yeah. um, chassis or, you know, Fantex chassis, which is just clean. Um, and you don't want to essentially have, you know, multiple RGB lighting points that are inside your system. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, right? It's ultimately just what you decide upon and picking those right components, uh, picking those right components. But um, I definitely am a fan, I think, of customization. And so I've, I've done everything from, you know, custom backplates to doing things with, you know, different types of fan configurations, different setups. I think we got, you know, um, and that's kind of another thing too, right, that you can do is that you can play around with a lot of different stuff. So when it comes to even fans, um, like there are two options here. This is a partner fan. This is from Cooler Master. They make, um, you know, many Aura compatible products. Mm -hmm. And here the LED lighting is built into the fan. But another option might be something like, I can reach over here in the bag of holding again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, might be something like this. This is from Fantex. And Fantex makes these really cool uh, Halos frames that also are yeah. compatible. So, um, with these, they plug directly into the header on the motherboard, so they can all be controlled via our Armory Crate software, even though they're not an ASUS branded product. But the cool thing is that you can then take something just like your standard uh, white fan that might have come with your chassis, put this frame on it, and now you will have an RGB lighting effect. And it actually changes the aesthetic quite a bit because it's more of this um, kind of soft diffuse lighting that is yeah. layering on top of the fan as opposed to the fan inherently having the LED uh, be built in there, right? And have it be diffused in that way. So um, that's, I think that's the fun thing about PCDIY is that there's a lot of flexibility and there's a lot of choice. And our goal at the end of the day is to really try to facilitate that through the design of the boards, the connectivity that we're giving you, and through, of course, the soft, software options like, you know, our Armory Crate software or, or Creator software to be able to let you manage and control all these things. 
Oh yeah, I, I mean, and it's uh, it, it, it's kind of funny. I mean, before we were doing all of this social distancing, uh, my my, I had a cousin in college whose roommate was just full full bore, super bright, strobing rainbow R- R- RGB, and it was just like it would keep him up at night because it's like this machine was inescapable. Um, but <laughs> I, I did want to talk about you know we're, we've been tying. Uh, obviously, ASUS has sort of a backbone, uh, sort of an an architecture, and sort of an idea of all the different components. Um, a lot of people that are coming from system building and, are, and might be picking and choosing from different manufacturers, it still has been one of the common conversations that uh, piecing all of this together is still kind of a challenge. You know, we might have multiple pieces of software that need to address different components on the system. Uh, what What is ASUS doing to address? Because I'm sure you're getting a ton of feedback from, from users in the space. Um, what What is it that ASUS is trying to accomplish in trying to sync everything together for this new, uh, this new platform for lighting? Yeah, you know, control is, I think, uh, something that is kind of wired almost into the ASUS DNA is that we've always been advocates for trying to give control. Uh, when you go about PC building, there's so many different things that you're trying to control, right? It could be something like how do you control easily your fans, right? Because not only do they affect the performance in terms of the airflow and the cooling, um, but you also want to be able to easily adjust for how they sound, right? What are the acoustic profiles uh, for your system? So there, you know, we've uh, for a long time had really class leading UEFI options in the firmware environment. So if you don't want to have to go into any software, you can just tune all those parameters inside the UEFI and control and calibrate your fans. Um, but then if you want to be able to take it further, you can go into the operating system, you can go into fan expert, you can name the fan headers, right? You can adjust the fan ramping speed, you can switch back and forth between a custom fan curve or a fixed, um, you know, uh, RPM that is all available to you. Um, you know, to your point on something like RGB lighting, I think our goal was as we continue to see more and more users want to be able to have um, essentially more control. And we knew that we were really leading the market in terms of not only motherboards and graphics cards, that was kind of a natural segue opportunity for us to say, hey, let's make sure that our software ecosystem is designed to be able to be complementary and offer this sync. Um, And so we were really kind of the first to be able to generally offer kind of this sync type narrative, right? So that if you had an Asus graphics card, you had an Asus motherboard, and now as we've expanded into things like the coolers, Mm -hmm. even power supplies, Um, All these devices, they will all speak to each other in one unified interface and you can control it. Um, And it's become very important for us. You know, if we actually take a look at the expansiveness of our Armor Crate software, there's not a bigger RGB ecosystem that exists from any manufacturer. Our systems groups are, are of course, RGB enabled products and they would work with things like all our RGB peripherals from headsets to keyboards Mm -hmm. uh, to mice. Right. Those also work on our uh, component products. You then account all our component products and then the range of products that all have now Armory Crate. It's a huge undertaking, but we have a dedicated team that we're now working on uh, for what we call milestone releases that we're targeting, you know, uh, every few months to keep improving the core functionality, the stability and the overall end user experience. And definitely, I think for some users, if they first tried out something like our first generation or software, there's been a lot of changes and a lot of improvements that we've made. And um, I would definitely say for any users that are using the current generation, they've found um, a pretty good experience. And it's one that we're also committed to continue to improving. I, it's, um, it, the, the, it, I, uh, in our previous conversations, I, there was always that kind of fun, uh, XKCD style conversation, like, oh, there are so many different, you know, uh, standards that you need to operate with. Someone should just make one standard that ties everything together. And then six months later, it's, oh, there's 15 new standards because everyone's trying to make their own. Um, yeah, the, the, the challenge I think definitely with that regard is, I mean, for us, um, you know, we have done a partnership. So we actually have made our OR application an open mm-hmm. SDK. So it is open to the, uh, you know, to partners to be able to integrate. Um, we did actually have this actually um, end up occurring with uh, Corsair, where while Corsair does have their own uh, RGB lighting ecosystem of components and their own software IQ, um, you can actually optionally integrate Aura support into IQ. So there is kind of a bridge experience. Yeah. Um, but you know, we do generally feel that with the Armory Crate and our goal of kind of u- offering this unified experience, not just for ASUS, because keep in mind you can go to let's say the ASUS or a website, and you will see that we have a huge number of partners that instead of using proprietary connections or controllers, they all interface directly in with the motherboard, right? So, you know, we talked about examples there being uh, like, you know, Cooler Master or Fantex 
um, you know, Thermaltake, EK. There's many partners that all work with us in these open, open standards that are built onto the motherboard, and they all can be controlled from R1 software. So we think we're offering a great balance of not only offering, you know, control and synchronization capabilities for our own ecosystem, but also a wide range of partners that are working with us. Oh, absolutely. I mean, then that, thank you for kind of summing that up because the bad joke out of the XKCD reference was just talking about, I think this has helped the explosion of RGB popularity. It, it, again, it's it's a little less intimidating. It's easier to get these things talking to each other and having that be sort of core to the, to the main backbone of the system that you're building has helped tremendously. But I can't let you go on, on a stream you know, talking about modifying a, a system that you've already built or putting together a PC, I, I can't let you leave until we at least chat a little bit about overclocking because uh, anyone watching a stream like this is probably a bit more inclined to dabble in some tweaking and tuning. And, uh, you know, we, we get these kinds of questions at Newegg, just like straight up point blank. I'll get someone just tagging me in a Twitter, uh, in a Twitter conversation, should I overclock, period. And like, that's yep. the end of the question, like no other <laughs> information or what's going on. So point blank, JJ, should someone overclock? Yes or no? <laughs> there is no uh, easy answer in that regard. Um, I, I knew I, that was such a gimmick to set up. Yeah. I'm I sorry, think I the tricky part that. is, uh, of course, there's an A and B answer from the perspective is, does your hardware actually support it, right? So, um, you know, take for instance, like on Intel, Intel has a series of processors and a series of chipsets, which don't support any overclocking. So you mm -hmm. can't overclock on there, right? It's right. essentially just going to be able to offer the stock level of performance that's advertised with that part. Um, both Intel and AMD, though, do offer chipsets and CPUs that do fully support overclocking. You know, from my perspective, and I think from Asus's perspective, our goal is to say, what are the kind of the experiences that we want to help to enable for a user? So if you're interested in performance tuning, it might not always be traditional kind of just overclocking, let's say the multiplier, getting to a higher frequency. There might be other approaches that you might be interested in. Um, with AMD, there's a lot of people that try to focus on maximizing efficiency or the power envelope. Um, this might be through utilizing things like undervolting. So how do we enable rich options inside of our UEFI uh, to be able to enable this? Um, can we enable specialized functions uh, to help to maximize, let's say, uh, built-in overclocking features like PDO, which is part of the Ryzen architecture. Uh, and we have done this. Uh, take, for instance, like on our B550 series and motherboards, they feature a technology that we call um, Asus Ape. Um, the Asus Ape is just a little toggle switch where it'll automatically adjust the PBO operating parameters specific to the VRM, uh, specific to the motherboard design, um, so that it can maximize essentially power uh, envelope uh, kind of settings in relation to the CPU that you have installed to help to give you better uh, multi-threaded performance. Um, that is also performance tuning. So I think overclocking has evolved in that it's not just kind of one specific thing anymore. Um, there's a lot of different ways to kind of approach performance tuning. And I think from Asus's perspective, that's one of the really great things you get when you buy an Asus board is that not only are we spending the time and effort from an R&D level to give you really rich options, uh, whether they're, again, they're in the UEFI, um, or in the operating system, um, but also I think intelligent options. Um, examples like on our uh, Intel series of boards, we have a technology called AIOC, where it was the first time that we uh, had such an extensive full algorithmic database that was based off of literally thousands of hours of testing, uh, thousands of CPUs, and it was a, a predictive intelligent system that was responsive to the cooler that you would actually have installed. We would actually track the actual cooler results under load. That would help to actually correlate to the frequency that would be set by your motherboard. And even kind of previous concerns about people saying, oh, the voltage is gonna be too high. We would use intelligent voltage adjustment um, so that it's not what's called a fixed or static voltage, but the actual voltage would come down mm -hmm. when you're idling and you're not doing anything. And then it would ramp up depending on the load and also the corresponding frequency. Um, so these are things that we spend a lot of time and effort on. And we also, as I think a vendor, um, really pride ourselves on trying to offer more information, more insights through through guides, through videos, through community engagement, so that users have a better understanding. But um, I think the great thing about PCDIY is that, you know, we there are a lot of options for there. Um, for users that want to be able to approach performance tuning. Yeah, I, I don't know in your experience, but I, I find in mind that the, the conversation around um, overclocking, that seems to be still one of the, the biggest misconceptions is it's this hot rod, maximum clock speed kinds of conversations. And where in the past, there's also been some of that stigma on um, 
like old school overclockers and software overclocking being kind of a dirty phrase, but you know, without getting too buzz buzzwordy about things like machine learning, it really does seem that we've we've developed and and, and Asus has been working on developing methods that track to I mean to the microsecond levels of performance to dynamically adjust this. And that seems to me like it would be a bigger perk for someone just getting started in, in this kind of performance tuning, knowing that there's something that's kind of watching all of this as opposed to just going into an old BIOS and saying, I don't know, throw a bunch of voltage at it and let's see how fast I can make it go. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, um, you know, it can definitely be challenging. You know, there there can be a lot of information out there. There can be a lot of conjecture, and it can be sometimes uh, confusing. But I think that's part of the reason why that I think when you kind of make the commitment to build a system, if you're interested in these performance options, that is really kind of one of the key benefits of going. I think with ASUS is that we've done a lot of this work to be able to give you options that you can go in there and you can make these adjustments in whatever way works best for you and that you're going to be most comfortable with. Um, whether that's simply, like I said, executing it within like AI suite and in the operating system, or you know, going into the traditional UEFI BIOS and making those adjustments mm -hmm. there. Um, but to your point as well on, you know, sometimes a, a misconception on that software isn't necessarily always a reliable mechanism or that it, it can't offer the same type of scalable results. The reality is, is that the software is essentially just a end user interface. Mm -hmm. um, so many of our essentially more advanced, essentially overclocking options, um, they're actually working in concert with hardware based designs. So they're working in conjunction with the UEFI firmware. Um, they're working in conjunction with a microcontroller that we have on board and many other parameters so that when these actually values get tuned and adjusted, um, they're actually happening, quote unquote, on a hardware level, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I think that's a really impressive part. And there are also actually benefits to doing things real time in the operating system. Sometimes users don't realize it, but if you dynamically, let's say, adjust your frequency and your voltage in the OS through something like the system utility, you can immediately stress test your system and you can check right. the actual load frequency, the load voltage, and these parameters in real time. Um, if you make these adjustments in the UEFI, you actually have to go through what I call the boot process, right? You have to make the adjustment, boot up into the operating system, load up your application, stress, check that value, and then kind of go back and then readjust those values. Um, and while that definitely can work, there's nothing wrong with doing that. It can be quite a bit quicker and more responsive to do it real time within the operating system. So again, we're not saying one option is, is clearly better than the other. I think for us, we are always looking at the architecture and the design and the goal with, you know, really trying to provide you the best experience possible when you want to go about performance tuning and, you know, give you those options, whether it's going to be, you know, really specialized options, like are you going to find on our ROG series of motherboards versus, you know, the more traditional options, which you might have, let's say, like a tough gaming motherboard. And that's, you know, gets back to the very first point on even kind of picking a motherboard, mm -hmm. right? How much of an enthusiast are you? Are you somebody that really is going to spend the time to kind of tweak and tune, uh, you know, the, the latencies on your memory? right? And you want to get them really tight and really efficient. It might be worth the investment of spending a little bit more and getting an ROG series motherboard um, that offers you, you know, the ability to have tighter timings uh, be set and offers more specialized DRAM profiles or has, you know, specialized voltage monitoring for the CPU, right? I mean, again, you, you, you sort of sidelined from where I was going to make another terrible joke. Like some people just like to reboot a whole bunch but but that does seem. I mean, we, we we tend to cater some of these conversations in our live streams, you know, sort of trying to keep as as uh, as inclusive an audience and conversation as we can. But especially as we start talking to people that are more experienced with some of uh, some of the stuff, especially getting into to topics and concepts like overclocking, it does seem to me. And and, and I'd love to hear just like your thoughts on this as we kind of wrap up this live stream. That conversation seems to be pivoting away from just. Um, maximum maximum clock speed, that the experienced overclockers are now actually starting to lead conversations about more nuanced performance. The undervolting conversations have been really fascinating to follow over the last couple of years. And that just seems to be the trend for, for tailoring and fitting uh, a system to certain parameters as opposed to just trying to blow up the biggest, uh, I almost said something very crude, trying to blow up the biggest uh, benchmark measuring <laughs> that people can get away with. 
Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's PCDIY. So it, there's going to be a lot of different, uh, you know, approaches and all of them are, are valid. You know, uh, we continue to be the, the most uh, world record holding manufacturer of motherboards for, you know, those extreme users that do literally want to push the envelope on CPU frequency and on DRAM. I wanted to um, give you the, the opening to say to say that that when it comes to measuring, <laughs> that, that measuring those sticks that Asus yeah, can, and, can measure with the best of them. <laughs> exactly. You know. And if you want to go that route, then you can go that route. But, you know, for the vast majority of users, they're not they're not setting up a system on a bench top and using liquid nitrogen They're You know, <laughs> they've got um, a basic, you know, 240 millimeter AIO. And so what is the experience that they're going to get out of that? And so I think our goal there with things like the AIOC technology or auto tuning technology or specialized presets, dynamic OC switcher, which is a new exclusive option that we offer on our X570 Dark Hero motherboard or the APE option that we offered on the B550 series. All of these are ultimately being put in place, right? So that, you know, again, are, you know, are you a content creator trying to help to maybe improve the performance for your render workflow and your export? Um, are you, you know, somebody that's jumping into, um, you know, Warzone and, you know, because of the high, you know, CPU instances that are getting rendered out, you want to try to just improve a little bit of that minimum frame rate, right? You want to try to ratchet up and see if you can get an extra five, six, seven frames, right? Um, these are all kind of things that you, the, 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 the reality is that, you know, there's there's no right or wrong way to kind of approach this. It really just depends on your use case and your scenario. If you find that there's a benefit to it, um, our you know our goal is just to make sure that we give you those range of options so that when you're taking a look at all the hardware, right? When you're taking a look at the motherboard, when you're taking a look at the graphics card, because people of course also overclock your graphics card. When you're then taking a look at your cooling solution, right? Do I have everything I need to be able to try to push the envelope of that performance that I'm looking for? Um, and this is also you know, uh, where there is value to sometimes getting products that maybe you just want the absolute best performance possible and you don't want to have to tweak anything. Mm -hmm. Some people sometimes wonder, well, why would I want to buy an example? It might be something like our, our ROG Strix graphics card, or we might have two variants of like, let's say a tough gaming card. One is the overclocked version and the other one's the non-overclocked version, right? Mm -hmm. Why should I spend more money to buy that? Well, the benefit is the one that's factory overclocked. We've already done the work for you, right? right. It's you've checked it and validated <laughs> it at the production facility. And we know that it already offers that essentially that very common level of performance, but it's been validated. So the user doesn't have to worry about it. Now, might you be able to extend it even a little bit more than what we've already done <laughs> the facility? For sure, that's a possibility, right? But this is a way of allowing, I think, also users to have that choice that they can get more performance, right? Um, and this also happens with motherboards. You know, the difference between like an ROG Crosshair and a B550-F, they're right. both going to offer great performance. If I was to put, uh, you know, um, a Ryzen 3600X or if I was to put in a Ryzen 5800X, at stock, the performance is almost going to be the same. But the ROG boards, we do tune them a little bit more tightly, a little bit more aggressively. The power limits are set a little bit you know, higher so that there is going to be a little bit even higher level of performance. So while overall, you shouldn't make the investment in a higher end board purely because of a perspective that it's going to perform better. You should buy it because, oh, it has you know, a higher quality audio connection on the board. It has more RGB lighting zones. It has more USB ports. It has the integrated IO shield. It has more SATA ports. Whatever those supplemental features are, there is also going to be some performance benefits. And so this gets back to just, you know, tailoring, I think, your part selection to complement, you know, what it is that you want to make an investment in. If you're somebody that's in PCDIY and you really like kind of messing around with the knobs and switches, then, you know, go with something that's going to give you that flexibility. But at the same time, if you don't want to and you just want something that you can put together and feel confident uh, that it's going to be stable and reliable, then you can definitely go that route as well. And it just always makes me happy that this is a conversation that evolves over time, that you're not putting something together that's then going to be glued shut, that you've got that a uh, little bit more extra control to, to add some parts or pieces as needs arise. I, I just took a look at the time, JJ, and like, uh, we're, we're getting to the end of the stream, man. The time just flies. I'd, I, I, uh, I have to reiterate. As it been, does. It's been a little too long, man. I, I, I hope we can, uh, we, we can kind of catch up again sooner than letting an entire year go by than we did last time. 
Yeah, well, uh, you know, like always, you know, we've, we're, we're going to be busy throughout the year. You know, we've got a big product portfolio and uh, the new year's coming along with CES. So mm -hmm. as always, you know, Asus is going to have a lot more cool stuff going to be coming out. So I, I'm sure that we're going to be having some upcoming opportunities. And for anybody that's out there, you know, if we didn't answer your guys' questions, um, you know, we recently launched a really cool PCAOA Facebook community. You can join the group there. I'm the actual admin that's in within that group. Um, we uh, do weekly in-group streams. I answer a lot of questions. We get build guidance, um, you know, we help to uh, supplement, you know, support and insights if you're going through kind of building your PC and you're wondering about, hey, how do I do this? How do I connect this? Do I need a fan splitter or do I need an <laughs> RGB splitter uh, and all that and more. And, and also, of course, you guys can check out all the respective links, you know, for all our different social media channels. Um, but, uh, you know, it's been great talking to you. Yeah, it's, it's been really nice and, and, and good to see that you're doing well. So um, we should probably wrap this up. I guess we could give away some stuff like some new egg gift cards i think that would be a good idea i suppose i just got a list of names coming in from mike i i, I i'm running the stream i didn't actually think to build in any sound effects or fun graphics for the giveaway part so uh, i'm just gonna switch the video so that we're looking at that really pretty build video that we put together for the uh um, for your Asus gear there. So uh, in, in, in no order of importance, uh, the winners uh, getting some Newegg gift cards. You will be uh, contacted by the Newegg team, the Newegg Ninjas. Uh, they'll be in contact with getting you uh, th something to uh, buy some fun kit for your own holiday spending. Uh, one Sir Chunky Buns, uh, Dai P, Eric M, Eli Eastwood, M2KMGS, Thomas G, J Lim, Cursed 13, Blake H, and Purple Lace 28. Congratulations. You're going to be uh, getting to spend a little extra cash this holiday season. And uh, like I said, the, uh, the New Egg Ninjas will be in touch with getting you uh, getting you those um, those gift cards. And, and again, just a major thank you to everyone tuning in for these streams. Uh, these are the kind of conversations I love getting into. So uh, while we weren't addressing as many comments directly from the live chat, I've been reading through the conversations and just uh, it's so much fun to be you know, sort of contributing to this community. Uh, JJ, again, thank you so much for joining. Uh, um, this this is always so much fun to to kind of dig into these details with you. And and like I said at the top of this uh, stream, I mean, not not blowing smoke. When it comes to wrapping up trends and talking about new technologies and new platforms, I mean, you're one of my favorite conversations to host. And and I'm just really glad we could spend this time. Thank you so much. It's been fantastic to be able to spend some time with you talking about, I think, PCDIY and what ASUS brings to the table. And I want to thank everybody that's joined the stream. Um, you know, thank you guys so much. If you guys have been users of ASUS, you know, over the years, um, or you're considering ASUS, we sincerely and uh, really appreciate your guys' support throughout the years that allows us to be in the position that we're in. And we look forward to be able to help to give you guys the best experience as possible when it comes to PCDIY. So make sure to check out any of those respective links, and uh, hopefully I'll see you guys somewhere on the internet. Yeah, definitely. Oh, we'll definitely catch you around the internet. All right, folks, just some reminders as we wrap this show up. I, if you can, hit the links in the show description for more info on the different options and parts from ASUS for your own build and upgrades, including the parts lists that JJ helped us put together, and then also the, the systems that the New Egg Ninjas have been working on for that PC Builder Kit. There's a ton of great info on that New Egg PC Builder site. And, and also, I, I want to shout it out again, the PC Building Fund continues today with ASUS during their PC DIY day. Definitely hit up the ASUS site for more interviews, streams. Uh, you guys are hosting some giveaways too, right? Yeah, that's correct. We've got different things going on there. If you guys head over to the actual website, you'll see a breakdown of pretty much everything that's been going on today. And uh, this is also a bigger initiative from us in general. So you're going to continue to see more about the ASUS PC DIY initiative as we kind of round out this year and we move into 2021. So uh, there's always going to be continued opportunity if you guys are interested in, uh, you know, being able to get yourself um, some, you know, some choice ASUS hardware, you know, just make sure to t stay tuned to our uh, course respective social channels and we'll definitely provide announcements. All right, that's going to do it for us. Again, thank you again, everyone tuning in, those of you watching, commenting, subscribe to the channel. And, and just personally, this holiday season, I hope you're all staying safe. I hope you're, you are staying warm while your PC runs cool. And I hope you get to play some great games with people who don't grief you too bad. So for New X Studios, I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, uh, and I'll catch you all on the next live stream.